start here. Hello, anyone. And let's talk about unsupervised learning. In this chapter, we're going to explain principal uh, component analysis and completion methods. The closing ones, we're going to leave that for next week. So, what's the purpose of principal component analysis? So, when we have many variables, uh, making a lot of two dimensional scatter plots gets less insightful. Since it's contained just a small fraction of the total information present on the data set, so you will waste a lot of time just checking and you won't find anything in whatever case. So, what we need to do, we need to create Latin variables, variables that wasn't originally in the data, but are, co are really important for relations. For example, if we go to a supermarket and we recall what we buy, and many people buy, for example, many people uh, should buy cheese and mayonnaise, or mayonnaise and bread, or bread and cheese, and so on, we could say that, oh, these people is buying things to make a sandwich. So instead of having all these columns in our data, we just could have one column that say, hey, this is a sandwich. The same with these brands of soda, Pepsi, Coke, 7-Up, and as well with the vegetables. So that's what we want to get when we perform a principal component analysis at the end. Uh, so at the end, the process helps us to reduce the number of features needed to describe the data and remove multicollinearity between features. So it's really common to have bread and cheese together. So we don't need to see that Again, we just need to say, oh, it's sandwich, and that's it. We saw in the first chapters that the collinearity is a really big problem in order to make inference uh, with the linear models. You go and found, so you don't know what's the cause of the change, as you have many factors that say the same thing. The graphical description of the process is the first principal component loading vectors represent the line in the p-dimensional space that is closest to the end observations, since the line could provide a good summary of the data. So it's like a meme. So you, you are trying to find the place where you can have the closest Euclidean distance to the data. So Euclidean distance is a straight line, basically. Uh, and the power of this is that you don't have that approximation just for a one dimension that happened with the mean, for example. You will have that for all the P dimensions. So if you have 100 dimensions, you will have the closest uh, plane or shape, depending on how many variables. There's no way to graph, to graph that number, of, but you have the the closest approximation to all the dimensions of the data for each data point. But the second principal component, lo uh, loading vector, we could expand the closest plane to the observation in terms of average or square equivalent distance, provide a good summary of the data. In this case, they are making an example with three dimensions. They don't explain where, that, where are the dimensions. Let me, I think, I know. So it's like we have something like that here. They don't explain what they mean, but the point is this plane that we see here is the result of the principal component analysis. And it's the closest plane that could be. So this is a three-dimensional space. And here with two dimensions, because this plane just have two dimensions, how we can get closest to the data. So basically, that, that's the main point. You will have 
less components that are closest to the data, and you remove correlation by taking together things that happen at the same time. Okay, let's explain how is the mathematical description of this. PCA finds low dimensional representation of the data set that contains as much variation information as possible. It assumes that all dimensions can be described as a linear combination of the p original variables. And when we say linear combination, we say, oh, one value, one variable. Uh, the, the one number, and this variable, one number is, is a linear combination. And we know that this is a principal component score, where these fees represent the loading vector of the principal component. This is this com this loading vector are really, really important because they yes, they explain which variable is most important to describe the new variable, the new variable C. And we also need to know that all these loading vectors, the square of the loading vectors, uh, should be one, just to, to keep the same. It's like a uni unitary vector. So, they don't want to change the dimension of the original values. So you have a, a range, for example, from two to 100. This room avoids that your range go farther, for example, two to 1,000. You want, you, you want to keep your range the same. So this room, is the key to, to allow that. So to perform a PCAs, we need to make any needed transformation to tidy the data, remove or impute missing value, transform our variables to be numeric by using method like one hop encoding. One hop encoding is for example, you have in a column A, B, A, you will, step, you will create a column A, B, and you will have one here, zero here, uh, zero here, one here, one here. So this is one hop encoding. So you transform your, your factors into number, numbers. Then it's really important to center and scale all variables. As this method is really sensible to the dimension, the different dimensions of the, the range of each variable. This step is important to ensure all variables are in the same scale, particularly if they were measured different units or have outliers. So here I have one example of how we can scale numbers. For example, I start creating one distribution of 10 values with a mean of 100 and 10 values with the, with the mean 500. So S2 is much higher than S1. Then we melt and scale. This is a base R function, but for each variable, for S1 and S2. And then we check the distribution. So after scaling, even though this but the S1 was lower than S2, then they both have similar distribution. We have really similar values in the uh, first quartile and the third quartile, and also, of course, the mean is zero in both cases. So even though they were different distributions, they are now in really similar ranging. So 
So the load inverter is determined by solving the following optimization problem using H decomposition. It identifies the direction of the layer variance in the feature space and reverses the relative contribution of the linear features to the PCM. And now we need to repeat this process until we have M minus one of P components. Each new components must be orthogonal to all previously computed principal components to ensure to each of new components captures a new directions of variance. So what it, that means is if we were checking here the direction sandwich, we don't want another variable measuring the same direction sandwich. We want another direction, maybe vegetable, maybe soda. Using an uncorrelated new component. A proportion variance explain. To know how much information variance in a given data set is not contained after projecting the observation onto the first principal component, we can use proportion of variance explainer of each component. So it's like, this is the proportion of how much variance is explained by a component. This is the equation to explain this. And the total variance of the data set explained by this. So it's really close to R squared that we saw in linear regression. And this value, the proportion variance explained, gets always lower. So we, the, the first principal component always explains most of the data and it reduces this connection as you add more components to your analysis. And as well to R squared, the commutative probability explainer, it increases as you add the number of components. So it's a really good measure. How we can do principal components in R? And to make this, we are going to use the my basket data set. This is from another book, hands on machine learning with R. This is the book. I do for taking those examples. So we, we have the stats, that is the base R package. We also can use H2, H2O. Oh, we also can use recipes. So yes, we have three ways to compute the principal component analysis in R. The, maybe the disadvantage of using H02 is that you really need to install Java in your computer. It relies on Java. But the other two ones, no, they are using just based on. So let's explain with stats. Uh, we, are going to, we are going to use Bloom just to make the tidy our results. So in base R, you need to have this function to perform principal component analysis, you can save it in our variable. To extract the importance of each component, the loading vectors, you need to write tidying and, and matrix agent values. And you will have a really nice uh, table with this. Identify which of our original features contribute to the Principal components by accessing to the loadings. Two different software packages will guide the same principal component loading vectors. Also, the scenes of those loading vectors might differ. So, but we, not, we want to understand reality is that even though these three ways are making the same thing, we might not get the same directions. And we will see a uh, soon, when we see the explanations, it's like maybe what is positive in one component for one package might be negative in the other one, but we are explaining the same circumstances. 
So we we start making or uh, understanding the first principal component. In this, we are projecting uh, the loadings of the first principal component. So we can see here a boomers, red wine, a Mars, tweets, whiskey are the most important features. So PCI can be interpreted as unhealthy lifestyle component as higher weights are associated with less healthy behavior, such as alcohol. All these are uh, alcoholic drinks, sweets, uh, tobacco, tobacco, and potentially gaming, uh, gambling lottery. So yeah, these components get higher as is unhealthy. That could be the interpretation. Uh, to understand how to name this new component, I used a uh, chat GP, uh, chat GPT. Uh, it's really useful. You can create a test with all the components and the, the loadings related. And he really on, uh, can help you to, to, uh, to give you some suggestions that can be really useful. If we go to H2. Uh, in this in this case, yeah, the result was really close. It's like the same correlations. And entertainment lifestyle. Yeah, unhealthy and here are entertainment lifestyle. So yeah, it was okay. I didn't apply any new interpretation for recipes. One. Well, then we have this other one that takes kitchen, lasagna, pizza, uh, white wine. The second principal component can be interpreted as dine-in food choices component. As associated items are typically part of main meal that one might consume for a lunch or dinner. Yeah, barbecue, pizza, yeah. That's the main reason of this component. And now we also can compare components uh, against the other to see how different features contribute to each PCA. I think, yeah. In this case, we can see the white wine, whiskey, red wine, and four pets are features that are part of the unhealthy and dying food choices. Yeah, people usually for dinner, take these things, and also they're unhealthy. Alcohol is not good for health. But we also can see its components. So it's unhealthy also to take the lottery, even though it's not a, a food choice for a main dish. Even though, you know, it's really interesting that the, this component doesn't explain that Pepsi or 7 are in that side, but are really close. So as you go to the right, it's unhealthy to you. And yeah, nobody takes carrots, this for a dinner, for a main a meal. So yeah, this, these scar plot are really interesting and just using the labels of each column. And you can understand how each column correlate in this space. And now we need to understand how we can select the number of features or components uh, that we want to use. So if you have in the original data 100 features, 
you don't want to use 100 features anymore. You want to use less, but how many less is the question. So the first criteria to select that is the variance criterion. The variance criterion. The sum of variance of H values of all components is equal to the number of variables entered into the PCA. So if we take the variance of all the components, uh, I, I was uh, yeah, of all the components, we will see that it's the same number of features of the original data. And the criterion is this. The variance of one means that the principal component would explain about one variable ball, uh, worth of the variability. In that sense, we would just interest in selecting components with variance ones or greater. So if your component cannot explain at least one variable, why do you want to give to, to spare to spend time checking that variable? Because you you can check this variable is 1.5, they're really close to 1.5, most of them. So the, the rule here is, oh, it's no, if, if the variance is no one, yeah, we don't need to check it. I think this method is really useful when you are making EDA with this approach. The other approach is proportion variance plane criteria. In this case, we take the accumulative variance. And for example, ah, I want to use 75% uh, of the total variance in my analysis. And of course, if you used to have 42 variables and now you are using 27, yes, it's most less. This approach to me seems better when you are maybe making a linear model or another uh, statistical tool to explain it most than making an EDA. And also, the creep plot criterion. The creep plot criterion used to elbow in the two set all components just before to a line far out, which in this case is the number eight. Yes, okay, I have this explaining variable, six, seven, okay, onto eight. That's the last because it was a huge decrease on the explanation. That also can be a criterion. But as we saw, the conclusion is that there is no a certain way to select a, the variable. It just depends. It's, for that reason, is for exploratory data analysis. But if you are making supervisors, like if you are taking the PCA up as a pre step to then create a predictive machine learning model, you can use cross validation to tune that parameter, the number of variables or the number of components to include in your model as a, in order to, to improve the prediction model. So take that in consideration. You can use, you can tune if you are using these as, as a pre-step. But if this is not a pre-step, if you are making it for understanding the data, yeah, is any of these methods you can prove in an objective way that is better than the other one. And now let's explore a little bit of matrix completion. Missing values. All the data have, have missing values, but most of the statistical learning methods cannot handle them automatically. Some possible solution could be remove the rows that contains missing observations. That could be a possibility. Replace missing values with the mean of the J column. That could be also. And we also can use a matrix completion to impute missing values using increasing per components after confirming that missingness is at random. Missing at random is important that there is no correlation. I know one example of missing not random. If, for example, 
you are measuring the speed of the wind. And then if the wind goes too fast, then the, the mechanics that used to measure, it cannot take the, the measure. And then you have a missing value. But what it is correlated with the with higher values of that measure. So you cannot predict that. Um, yeah, the point is that it's at random. No, it was a malfunction that doesn't happen always. Something like that that you want to, to impute. Okay, the way to impute this is, is follow the same, this step. Okay, you have your main, your original matrix, M uh, times P. That's the dimension of your da original data. And you have some observation that you know the value and some other that you don't know. So you take the mean of each column and impute the mean. And then you perform and solve this equation, uh, trying to make the minimum value. So you are optimizing the, the A and B matrix, which are matrix of dimension M times M. And B is a matrix P times M. So the A, the A matrix has the same rows to the original data, and the B column have the same rows to the original number of predictors. That's it. And then you try to minimize this number, and then you take this approximation and overlap the original uh, mean value. And then you calculate if the variable is closest to the data with the value that you really know. And you and that will happen on to the objective, this objective function, phase to decrease. So yeah, you are making processes, but you are not getting any improvement in the measurement, in the minimization measurement. And then you will return the variables. And that's the way that they they, they complete the variables. As I read, applying this method to the US address data set uh, will have this correlation, 0.63 for example. So to explain this, the first step would be to scale the matrix, to scale and convert it to a matrix. Then we need to understand the singular value decomposition, this, which is an algorithm that really matches into three other matrices in a way that can be taken back to the next function matrix equation. So X, the original data, is the result of this multiplication, the U matrix plus the D matrix plus the transpose of the B matrix. So the U is the matrix that transforms the linear data into a new dimensional space planned by a principal component. It represents the coordinates of the linear data after being transposed into the principal components. So, yeah, this matrix represents the new components, not the original ones. And the D is a diagonal matrix. So a diagonal matrix looks like that. So you have a matrix with one value here, zero here, value here, zero here. Uh, let's be a little bit bigger. And a value here and also zeros here. I think I have an exit here. Yeah. That, that's a diagonal matrix. So when you see it in R, yeah, in our, it looks like, oh, the D matrix is S, S, S. But really, it's just the diagonal part of this matrix that we are representing here. 
whose element represent the amount of variance. Got about the principal component in decreasing order. Of course, decreasing because the components are also in decreasing order. B is the transpose of the metrics that represent the principal directions of loading vectors in the input space, defining how each original feature contributes to the principal component. Now we create the SVD metrics, the list, and we also can see that the result of this is the same uh, to, the, to the transformation of the principal component analysis that we saw now. So the U matrix times the D matrix. Here is the scores. Calculate a scores vectors. As we have the dimensions the, and the variance or each one. Omitting, and now for this example, we need to omit 20 values. Of the, so we say the, in this way, we take a sim, uh, take the number of rows, and take a sample of 20. And, and here we take a, also a sample of each column just to select as we need of uh, these 20 observations need to be placed in one column, yeah, we, you need to select one of these four columns. And you combine all together and then you apply a name to each one. Then write this function, yes, for the, in the process we will see it. And starting with the algorithm, we need to approximate the missing values uh, with the mean. So the columns will take the mean of each column in the matrix, and you will be able to save them. And now that we have, we can compute the, the SV with the vectors. And let's continue here in the loop because I wasn't able to complete that part. Then they initialize these variables and use a while function. So then we continue the process until the error. Uh, so they will keep the this process until the error goes lower than the threshold. So they 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 take a really low number. Because if you expect exactly zero, then you never have a what you expect. But they apply this process until they have a really little change. And they create an iteration with the feed, uh, take the means. And at the end, they do the correlation of the of the missing values of the original data and the, the new data. And we see also a really good correlation. Of course, we have real a correlation because we already knew the original values. In, in a practical example, you won't have the opportunity because you don't know them. But it's a really good correlation. So it's a, a, a good approximation. And this process is really useful uh, for recommendation systems. That happens all the time in, 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 in platform like Netflix. When you want to know how each customer would like or don't like one different mood. And you have some of data, some data of each one, but not all the variables. And you can use this method also to impute these cases and create your recommendation system. So, right, this is the end.